Okay, hello. Um, so actually, I wanted to start by going through the first, I mean, the final paper assignments. Let's see if I can. Hmm. That's not really visible, is it? Hold on a second. Um, oh, there we go. That's better. Okay. So, um, yeah, there were some questions about this last week, but I just wanted to go through the whole thing and then see if there are more questions. Um, so uh, first of all, the main thing I should say about this is that it's quite different from the other two assignments. The other two assignments are basically like essay questions, um, whereas this one is actually a paper, which means that you're supposed to have your own uh, thesis that you defend, basically. Um, at least that's the simplest way to write a good paper. And I guess that's what I recommend for these purposes. Um, so, um, so there's a list of suggested topics. But I mean, first of all, those are only suggestions. Usually everyone writes about one of those topics, but it is not required. Um, um, but um, each one of those suggested topics, as it says here, has many sub questions, or most of them do anyway. And I mean, those aren't a list, unlike in the other assignments, whereas an essay question, you were supposed to answer every part. In this case, all those sub questions are just different ways of trying to um, help you think of something you want to say about this topic. So it's like either or, it's not like do all of those. It's kind of like, you know, like choose your own adventure. Like, you know, if you pick this one, you might want to think about this or that or this. Um, um, by the way, I guess if it's not obvious, I'm reading the PDF version of it. If the text is identical to the HTML version, you, you might be more likely to go to online. Um, um, so all the topics require you to make a substantial use of material from at least two of our authors, right? They're all supposed to be comparison topics. Um, I think it's easier to write a good comparison paper than it is to write a good straight on paper just about one author. Um, um, you know, if you're faced with Hobbes or something, like what does Hobbes think? That's really hard. But if you say like, okay, what does Hobbes really disagree with Locke about? I feel like that's easier, at least, I mean, it's easier to answer it well. Now, um, um, to answer it really well, you have to have a thesis, which is about the comparison between the two authors, right? So like, it shouldn't be possible to just divide your paper into two papers, one about one of the authors and the other about the other. You want to find something interesting about how they compare to each other. Ideally, you know, I mean, if you don't do that, then uh, it won't be as good a paper. Um, Um, you can use more than two, but there's no uh, requirement or extra credit or whatever. I mean, it's a pretty short paper. I would suggest that if you end up using more than two authors, you should uh, treat, you know, mention one of them only briefly. Um, but um, and 
yeah, you can use outside material if you want. Uh, again, there's I don't necessarily I don't really recommend that. Um, if you do, obviously, you have to cite it. Um, uh, to do that properly, you have to put any direct quotes and quotation marks, and you have to say where it comes from. And even if it's just a paraphrase, you have to say where it comes from. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll just add this. I've mentioned it several times now in this course um, that, you know, I had a lot of plagiarism last quarter. I don't want to see that again. That's the only reason I usually fail people on a paper is because of plagiarism. So um, it's just not a good idea. Um, you know, you're better off if the best you can do is like find a bunch of stuff in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something, uh, you know, put it in quotes and, and cite it. And then it won't be a very good paper, but you won't fail. <laughs> Um, so, um, okay, the next paragraph here says, the intent of this paper is to discuss the views or attitudes manifested in the reading rather than your own opinion on the topic. Again, that's mostly because I think it's easier to write well about that. Um, it's, uh, um, If I ask people, what do you think is the, you know, uh, about the state of nature or something like that? Um, or what do you think is the basis of legitimate government or whatever? I, number one, I feel that is too, that's unreasonably hard. Um, number two, uh, I think actually you're less likely to come up with an original idea in response to a direct question like that. Um, but anyway, even if you don't believe that last part, um, yeah, so um, so this doesn't mean just to summarize them. Again, if the best you can do is summarize them, well, you know, it's not the greatest paper, but hand it in. But I mean, but ideally you want to say, you want to have an arguable thesis about what these people mean. In particular about how what one of them means differs from how what the other one means. So, you know, as you've been paying attention to what I'm doing in lecture, you, you should, you know, realize at least that I don't think it's at all easy to figure out what they mean or how they agree or disagree with each other. It's really um, um, uh, difficult and controversial. So there's definitely things to be argued for here. Right. In other words, I'm not telling you to just regurgitate something. I'm telling you to have your own original idea, if you can, about how to understand these texts. Um, and I also encourage you not to, um, I mean, it kind of goes along with the same thing. Like, so the idea is not to judge whether the authors are right or not. Um, all of these authors say things that seem really strange. Some of them, maybe all of them say things that seem outrageous. Um, that can be a good way into writing a good paper because you ask, you say to yourself, well, that, that seems so ridiculous or outrageous. How could someone say that? And then that actually is a good question. How could they say that? So you can try to start figure out what they must be thinking to make that seem reasonable. But if it's just so bad that you can't, see any way of justifying it, write about something else because um, yeah, that in my experience doesn't produce a great paper um, writing about how wrong they are. Needless to say, writing about how they how right they are is even more boring, right? <laughs> I mean, um, uh, so, um, so again, so you're trying to figure out what they mean, which is in, at least in theory, is a preliminary step to deciding whether they're right or not. Now you can't say whether, you know, Locke's view on property is good or bad until you know what it is. And it's not easy to say what it is. It's, there's a lot of details that are hard to work out. Um, this is what I already said about the comparison paper. Um, there's no need to be fancy about this. You don't need a title page. You don't need a bibliography. I don't care about the format of citations as long as I can tell. 
uh, as I or Jonathan, the greater can tell um, what it is you're citing. Um, and oh, speaking of that, I'm sorry, I thought that the papers might be back at the beginning of this week, but there's been some delays both on my side and on Donovan's side. We're hoping to get you by the end of the week. I know that's a little bit, um, well, there's still two weeks left and then another week before the paper is due. So I hope that's sufficient. Um, all right, so are there questions about that or about this assignment? How to hand it in? No, or about any of the topics. Okay, well then I'll start talking about Wollstonecraft, uh, but if you think about something later, let me know. Now, how do I get back to what I wanted here? And to what I usually want here? Um, yay, okay. So, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Her dates are, I actually have a picture of her on a refrigerator magnet. Well, it's the same as the picture on the cover of the book. So in fact, one of my daughters, Alana, saw me reading the book this morning and she's like, hey, the fridge magnet. <laughs> anyway, um, so her dates are, um, 1759 to 1797. Um, she died uh, uh, due to complications from childbirth when she gave birth to her daughter, Ma Mary, uh, who went on to be, to be Mary Shelley, the, the author of Frankenstein. Um, uh, um, And this book, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, or I always forget, this is Rights of Woman. She, she wrote, I mean, she wrote more than two books, but she wrote one book called Vindication of the Rights of Men in the plural. And then later she wrote this other book called Vindication of the Rights of Woman in the singular. I'm not sure if that means anything, why she changed from singular to plural. Anyway, um, I guess Margaret Fuller might think she, yeah. Anyway, um, so this was published in 1792. Um, she uh, had a very eventful life between 1792 and her death. She was in France during the Reign of Terror. She uh, had a child out of wedlock with an American adventurer. She uh, was in Sweden for a while and then she married uh, his name James William. I don't remember one of those English names Godwin um, now known as the father of anarchism and he was the father of Mary who became Mary Shelley. Um, but yeah, so most of the really interesting things that happened in her life happened after this, in fact. Um, so I will, I mean, I just, I, I guess I just did talk about them. <laughs> I said I would, but I did. All right. Um, now, again, just for context, um, Rousseau's dates are 1712 to 1778. Um, Got to write down the dates of the discourse in the social contract here, but I believe they're around 1760 or so. So I think they were published when she was little. Um, um, so that's on, on this side. She did overlap with Rousseau, but this book was written after he had died. Um, and on the other side, she also overlapped with Kant. Um, Kant's dates are 1724 to uh, 1804. And the Critique of Pure Reason, 
The first edition was 1781. So, um, including her in a course on early modern political philosophy is a little bit of a stretch because, uh, um, well, I guess I said at the beginning of the course that you could end early modern political philosophy, which the French with the French Revolution that was 1789, um, or you can end early modern philosophy in general with the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason, that was 1781. So this book was written after both of those dates. Um, however, it does really still belong with uh, Rousseau more than it does with Kant, I think. Um, um, I have found some people after a very, um, unmethodical search in the literature claiming that Wollstonecraft was heavily influenced by Kant, but I don't see much evidence of that myself. There is one place that she mentions Kant in a posthumous, uh, I guess, kind of set of notes that were published posthumous, posthumously under the title Hints. Um, and she mentions Kant's aesthetics, his theory of the beautiful and the sublime. Um, so the beautiful and the sublime is something that Burke, well, I didn't say who Burke is yet. Um, um, but Edmund Burke with whom uh, Wollstonecraft was involved in a big argument. Uh, his first book was about the beautiful and the sublime. So that's something she would have had a reason to look into. Um, some of the things she say, sa says sound similar to Kant in some places. I can't rule out that she's basing it on him, but I don't sense that she's really mostly a post-Kantian. Um, I realize, I guess, I fear some of you who might like, especially legal studies majors might not know who Kant is. Uh, but if so, I, there's not much I can do to fill in now. Google Immanuel Kant. <laughs> so, um, oh, and Vanessa, what did you say whoa about? It could have been any number of things. It was her being um, Mary Shelley's mom. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, one other kind of biographical point about her or historical point about her. Um, if you've seen Hamilton uh, or if you know something about Hamilton, having not seen the musical Hamilton, you know Aaron Burr, the person who had a duel with him uh, and played other in other ways a big role in the foundation of uh, the United States, was a huge fan of Mary Wollstonecraft. He had a portrait of her on his you know, over his fireplace or whatever. <laughs> um, and he said he wanted his daughter Theodosia, who there's actually a song about in the musical. He said he wanted Theodosia to be just like Mary Wollstonecraft. And Aaron Burr actually, when he was a member of the New York State Legislature, introduced a bill for women's suffrage. Of course, it failed. Um, uh, so, right, women didn't actually get the vote in this country until much, much later, but uh, uh, Aaron Burr, at least, was spurred by, I guess, in part by reading Wollstonecraft to try to do that um, very early on. Okay, and I mean, I guess I should say it's not just Marin, Aaron Burr, but I mean, she, for various reasons, didn't have a lot of influence in, I guess, what you would call the main stream of um, Western political philosophy in the early 19th century. Like I asked someone I know who's kind of a Nietzsche nerd whether Nietzsche ever says anything about her anywhere in his notes or anything, and the answer is no. Um, that's the late 19th century, but anyway, and as far as I know, Kant doesn't respond to her, Hegel, or whatever. However, she was a big inspiration to the first generation of feminist thinkers in America, especially in New England. Um, so uh, eventually, she did have a pretty important influence in various ways. OK. Um, and her first important 
philosophical work. I already mentioned before, which published in 1790, was also Vindication, Vindication of the Rights of Men. And this was written in response to Edmund Burke's famous reflections on the French Revolution, which in turn was partly an attack on a sermon and a speech by Wollstonecraft's friend slash mentor, Richard Price. So Richard Price was a Unitarian so-called rationalist dissent or rational dissenter or minister. And uh, Wollstonecraft was involved with him early on. I mean, was, you know, in his circle. Um, these were a group of dissenters who rejected to the Church of England, not um, because uh, they thought it wasn't sufficiently Protestant, so to speak, but because they didn't approve of establishment of religion. They thought there should be freedom of religion. Uh, they didn't believe in what they considered irrational doctrines like the Trinity and original sin. Um, um, and when the French Revolution happened, Richard Price uh, gave this sermon and speech saying what a great thing the French Revolution was. Now, this was before the terror right? It was before the guillotine and all that stuff. Um, but nevertheless, Edmund Burke, who was a, you know, important um, sort of, I don't know how to put it, except like conservative liberal politician <laughs> in England. <laughs> um, he was, uh, he was in, he was, you know, he was a Whig. He was very much in favor of parliamentary rights and whatever, but he thought of them as the traditional rights of the English people that should be preserved. And he thought this revolution was a terrible thing and he wrote against it. And then Wollstonecraft um, sat down immediately and wrote this book arguing against Burke and defending Price. Um, so um, that would be an interesting book to read, but with, in order to understand it, we have to read Burke and pro possibly Price. And that's why I didn't think it would be work for this course. Um, on the other hand, this book, The Vindication of the Rights of Woman is basically a response to Rousseau. I think Rousseau is, is the main target here. There's other targets and sometimes she gets in a dig at Burke also. Um, but um, so um, now, obviously from the title, the main focus of the work is the rights of women in particular. Um, but she doesn't do that by just by saying, um, okay, uh, you know, you guys, Rousseau, Locke, whatever said men should have rights. Hey, women should have those rights too. Um, she does it by uh, re-examining the whole question of what human rights are in general and where they derive from and so forth. And she thinks Rousseau has gone wrong on that. Um, before he says, um, some things she really hates about the differences between men and women. Now, the things she really hates about the difference between men and women are mostly in Emile, which is Rousseau's kind of novel slash, it's hard to explain what it is, but it's like the fictionalized story of bringing up this boy Emile with the perfect education, <laughs> um, how he would do it if he had the chance. Um, and at the end, he introduces Emile's uh, um, future wife, Sophia, and explains how her education would be completely different um, and how what the relationship between them should be. So, I mean, as far as that, it's mostly that Rousseau that she is responding to on the rights of women. But she thinks that Rousseau goes wrong in the discourse. Now, the discourse that we read, which is the second discourse, the discourse on inequality, also Rousseau's first discourse, which is the discourse on the sciences and the arts. And also, I think some points in here are clearly responding to Rousseau of the social contract as well. Um, so that's why I thought this book would be a good fit for this course. 
Um, it does mean, you know, uh, if you look in the syllabus, you'll see you're skipping a lot of the middle chapters. A lot of the middle chapters are involved in all kinds of details about the relationship between men and women in late 18th century England. Um, uh, I mean, not that they're uninterestingly uninteresting, or I mean, they ultimately would be important to understanding her position, but I think um, um, that the more general things she says about human society at various points are more relevant um, to us in this course. But that doesn't mean that we won't be seeing things she says about women. That definitely will come up. Um, okay. Um, so how long did I spend on that? It's not too bad. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, by talking about her history of civilization, which is different from Rousseau's, it's different from Locke's or Hobbes also. Um, it's not, she doesn't go into it as, in as much length. Um, you know, again, partly it's because we're trying to get things out of this book that aren't exactly the main point of it, that are like preparations for the main point. Um, but, um, but I think there's enough in chapter one to, to draw this outline of um, the history, well, I guess as to say of the history of human society. First of all, there's the state of nature. She doesn't say that much about it, but she says enough that you can tell that it's, she, it's not the same as Rousseau's or Hobbes. Maybe closer to Locke's actually, but, um, but it's not exactly that either. And then after the state of nature comes a stage that she calls barbarism. Um, now, I mean, there's actually more than one state part to barbarism, um, but um, barbarism is, is characterized by violence and um, organization of society by force. So, I mean, there's first of all a kind of violent aristocracy. Right, as she says um, on page 17, um, In the infancy of society, when, when, when men were just, sorry, this is the uh, third paragraph on page 17. In the infancy of society, when men, notice that she uses men to mean men and women. Um, she does sometimes add or women in parentheses, not that much, but more than the other authors do for, I mean, for obvious reasons, she has that in her mind, but, um, but this uh, supposedly or ambiguously gender neutral use of men is, you know, something that women did too. Um, so in the infancy of society, when men were just emerging out of barbarism, well, see, now she's giving the lie to my title for the, she's saying they were emerging out of barbarism, but later she calls this barbarism. I don't know. When men were just emerging out of barbarism, chiefs and priests touching the most powerful springs of savage conduct, hope and fear must have unbounded sway. An aristocracy, of course, is naturally the first form of government. Um, so the first stage was an aristocracy, meaning government by a few, but it wasn't the kind of aristocracy that uh, Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau imagines. It was uh, an arist 
uh, it was government by a few who were not coordinated with each other, who were in competition, competition with each other. Chiefs and priests, maybe multiple chiefs and multiple priests um, uh, um, fighting it out with each other. And meanwhile, trying to dominate everyone else. Um, so like eventually what happens is that this normally turns into a kind of despotic monarchy. Namely, when one of the factions wins out, beats all the others and takes over. Um, but, um, um, but, and this is important, even at this stage, as she understands it, there's no claim on the part of the monarch that they have a right to govern, that they govern by consent of the people or anything like that. It's just, uh, they govern by force, right? They say, do what I say or else. <laughs> that's the way she pictures it. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly accurate of ancient monarchies. I think it's a little more complicated than that, but, um, or maybe a lot more complicated than that. But anyway, that's the way she understands that. It comes out of this uh, violence, uh, um, like chaotic, violent society with the leaders fighting each other. And it leads into a society that is still essentially based, still openly based on violence and the threat of, of violence. Um, But then after that comes the stage of what she calls partial civilization. So partial civilization is um, means that we've left this barbaric stage, but civilization is not yet perfected. And she's going to say a lot about that because she thinks that the current stage of European civilization is this stage of partial civilization. Right? So, like, um, if she had to answer, so, I, so first of all, we didn't read the first discourse, we read the second discourse. The question of, the, of Rousseau's second discourse was what is the origin of inequality among men, et cetera. The question of the first discourse was basically is civilization a benefit or, or not? Are we better off civilized or not? And of course, Rousseau answer is better off not. <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine that based on what we did read from Rousseau. So, whereas Wollstonecraft's answer is basically, you know, I'm told that this is apocryphal, but there's like famous story about someone asking Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he says, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> right? That's what Wollstonecraft's answer to the Academy of Dijon's question would be. Is civilization uh, a good thing? Well, it would be. <laughs> we just don't have it yet. <laughs> um, right, so um, so lying still in the future is a stage of full civilization. Um, and um, right, so as she says near the beginning of chapter one on page 12, um, uh, oh, this is page 12 in the wrong book. Just can you read that? Yeah, maybe. The civilization of the bulk of the people of Europe is very partial. That's basically where I'm getting this title, partial civilization. Um, 
and uh, um, so the way to go from the state we find ourselves in, or find ourselves in, she agrees with Rousseau that the state we find ourselves in is bad. Not necessarily that it's worse than the state of nature, but certainly it's bad. Um, but the way to go is forward, not backward. So um, this is the way she frames her disagreement with Rousseau about this. This is on page, this is this short paragraph after the first paragraph on page 14. Um, Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally. Usually I don't know why sometimes the light is like glare is washing out the text and other times it isn't. Well, that's not helping. Okay. I don't know. Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally. Um, professor, I've yeah. been posting the quote into the chat, if that's all right. Yeah, that's okay. I just still, I think some people might want to see it in the text, but maybe not. Anyway, Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally, a crowd of authors that all is now right, and I that all will be right. Right, so she's saying that a crowd of authors, people she kind of looks down on, like Burke, um, uh, you know, exerts themselves to, to show that the state we're in right now is great. We shouldn't want to change it one way or the other. Um, Rousseau, who she has a lot more respect for, exerts himself to show that all was originally right, right? That the state of nature, there was no problem. What does number four say? It says full civilization. <laughs> so, um, uh, Rousseau exerts himself to show that there was no problem in the state of nature and all the problems we have are our own fault for leaving the state of nature, basically. Whereas she is going to claim that uh, we were right to leave the state of nature and the state of barbarism, um, but we're just not done yet. That's our problem. Um, so, I mean, this is one thing you could mean or that might really be meant by calling someone a progressive. Um, I guess that nowadays means a lot of different things perhaps, but, you know, um, uh, she thinks the way to improve society is to go farther in the direction we've been going, not turn around or go back. Um, And similarly, she says at the end of the chapter, still talking about Rousseau, this is on the bottom of page 17. Um, I'm not quite the bottom of page 17. Oh, yeah, it is the bottom. Rousseau, oh, sorry. Had Rousseau mounted one step higher in his investigation, or could his eye have pierced through the foggy atmosphere, which he almost disdained to breathe? His active mind would have darted forward uh, to contemplate the perfection of man in the establishment of true civilization, instead of taking his ferocious flight back to the night of sensual ignorance. Maybe I should have called this true civilization. Whatever, it's the same thing. All right. I'll just leave it. So, um, right, so that, um, so again, with a little more detail here, the idea is 
that Rousseau found himself in this state. It was so bad. It constituted a kind of foggy atmosphere. He was too good to breathe it, to breathe that foggy atmosphere of the corrupt, corrupt partial civilization. Meaning, I guess, like he couldn't even bear to pay attention to it and to think how to improve it. I guess that's what the metaphor means, something like that. Um, where she's saying if he had stuck with it a little longer and carried his investigation one step for, forward, his gaze would have pierced that foggy atmosphere and seen what the future of this partial civilization could be. But instead, because he couldn't stand to deal with it, he just fled back to the night of sensual ignorance, namely the um, state of nature. Now, I mean, is this a fair characterization of Rousseau? Well, I mean, I hope you can kind of guess after everything I said about Rousseau that the answer is yes and no. It's, a, it's definitely more complicated than that. For example, he certainly doesn't think we can go back to the state of nature. Um, so he certainly does think that if there's any way to improve things, it has to be forward, not backwards. He may be pretty pessimistic if whether there's any way to improve things. Um, he also seems to think that there's a state that's better than the state of nature. Well, I mean, there's two things that are better than the original state of nature. One is that kind of savage state of nature um, that was said to be the best stage in the second discourse. And the other is Sparta. So she doesn't, um, have anything to say about the savage state in Rousseau. Um, but she has plenty to say about Sparta, as we'll see, and the Roman Republic. Um, but so in any case, um, it's more complicated than that, but it's not entirely unfair. Um, he definitely doesn't see uh, the current state of civilization as a stage on the way to perfection. Um, Tamara, do you have your hand up? Do you have another question? Oh yeah, I was just, oh, I, didn't, I was gonna highlight uh, Vanessa's question she asked about um, that, well, Wait. she mentioned not describing the state of nature and we kind right. of started with barbarism. Yeah, so but it like, wanted to be overlooked by Alvaro's, um, Alvaro's quote. Right, right. Oh, okay. Thank you. No, that's a good question. I didn't say anything about it. Um, like I said, she doesn't say much about it, but she does say that, um, um, well, I'm going to read this part in a second, uh, but she does say first, I mean, I guess. Her main criticism of Rousseau's version of the state of nature, and this could apply definitely to Hobbes too, is the idea that it was solitary. She says something I myself said when I lectured about this, namely that biology doesn't back that up, right? That other animals that are related to us don't live, sol live solitary lives. And she also says that various details about human biology suggest that we never would have lived. I mean, she mostly mentions the long infancy of uh, human offspring, um, right? Whereas Rousseau says, oh, it wouldn't have been a problem. The mother could just carry the kid around. Well, uh, Wollstonecraft actually had the experience of being a single uh, that was after she wrote this book, though, actually, so I can't count that. She did later have the experience of being a single mother with her kid in Sweden, where she didn't know anyone. <laughs> um, but I guess even at this stage, she recognized that that idea of just going around with your, you know, baby, like nursing as you gather acorns, <laughs> whatever might not be as idyllic as it seems. And she's like, no, I probably both parents had to be involved from the beginning. Uh, again, that's closer to, I think, Locke than to Rousseau or Hobbes. Um, um, so that's as much as I know, like what she positively thinks about the state of nature. Um, she also, I think, 
that uh, I gather that unlike Rousseau, she thinks it's not very stable. So in that sense, she is like Hobbes and Locke, right? She thinks that probably people didn't live that way very long, just in little family groups or whatever, but before they started fighting and trying to dominate each other, which led to the stage of barbarism. Tamara, your hand is still up. Is that the same question or do you have another oh, question? Oh yeah, it was up, but then you answered it because I was kind of confused. You, you mentioned this sol being solitary, but I was confused as if you meant like, she believed the state of nature was like a solitary state for individuals, but I think you, you answered yeah. it when you said people lived in little family groups. Right. It was no. The point is that Hobbes and Rousseau agree that the state of nature was solitary, right? Hobbes, we know it's part of the one famous quote from Hobbes <laughs> that it was nasty. It was solid. No, wait. What order did they go in? Solitary, brutish, nasty, and short. <laughs> That's what life in the state of nature was. So Rousseau thinks it was solitary and brutish, but not nasty and short. But he agrees with the solitary and brutish part. So uh, I guess. Um, you could say Wollstonecraft, it's not clear if she even agrees with the brutish part, to, to tell you the truth, but she anyway, she doesn't agree with the solitary part. Even if there was a time when human beings were just like wild animals, they were probably like wild animals that live in groups like chimpanzees or whatever. I mean, I don't know if she knows about chimpanzees in particular, but um, it was a long time before Jane Goodall, but um, uh, um, but certainly people know about uh, large brain mammals that they mostly, most of them live in social groups, not all. Um, okay. Um, it's, you know, it's less important for her what the state of nature was like because certainly compared to Rousseau, but I think this progressive direction marks her off from Locke and Hobbes too, that the justification such as it is for the way we live now is not gonna lie in what happened in the past in the state of nature. It's gonna lie in what it could possibly become in the future. So in other words, even though we left the state of nature, according to her, not by forming a covenant and doing all kinds of stuff like that, um, closer to the way Rousseau thinks we left the state of nature, someone kind of took over. Um, she, I think she said it was more by, by force than by deceit, but someone kind of took over and we had no choice. We left the state of nature. Um, um, and unlike Hobbes, she doesn't think that could justify anything. But she does think that this, in this direction, there could be justification. Um, okay, so what is that foggy atmosphere that Rousseau disdains to breathe? Well, I mean, basically, this state of partial civilization that we're in is a state of um, artificiality, um, artificiality, prejudice, and deception, including self-deception, right? No one is what they seem to be. Nothing is what they seem to be. Uh, nothing is based on nature, everything is out of harmony with nature, thinking is out of harmony with truth. But where nature here means not like the woods, right? Like nate, like the state of things before civilization or something like that. Rather, it means human nature, right? So the way we live now is out of step with our nature as human beings. And because of that, it involves all kinds of falseness. Um, so uh, in other words, 
uh, in this sense, she's close to Hobbes, right? Remember, for Hobbes, the law of nature, which is eternal and immutable, is, um, is a law that always applies because it's derived from necessary truths about human motivation. Um, so, uh, Basically, she agrees with Hobbes, not that the law of nature could justify any, no, see, where is the disagreement with Hobbes exactly? See, here's an example of what I was talking about, how a comparison is not easy. <laughs> it's, it, a comparison between two philosophers involves often the first answer you come up with turns out to be not exactly right when you think about it more. So, you know, so I was going to say like, well, Hobbes thinks the law of nature justifies the way we live now in monarchies. Um, whereas uh, Wollstonecraft thinks no way that we live now is justified by the law of nature. The, true or full civilization will be the state of human life that is justified by human nature. But the truth is Hobbes, you know, I mean, remember like compared to Aristotle, for example, who says that uh, human beings are political animals, meaning animals whose nature it is to live in a Greek city state, essentially. <laughs> um, uh, he, and he's thinking of an actual place that he actually lives. Hobbes, in, in the end, it turns out that there may be no well-constituted commonwealth anywhere, according to Hobbes. Certainly the British uh, monarchy has never been correctly con constituted. Since William the Conqueror, there's always been the seeds of this, these problems. The kings always, you know, acknowledge the independent authority of the church. They always acknowledge the independent authority of the nobles. Um, it was never set up right from the beginning. Um, so, uh, so the difference is something else. Harder to put your finger on. It's certainly different. I don't think that I don't think for a second that Wollstonecraft's um, true civilization would look like Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, but they're both like aspirations outside of the way we actually live. Um, well, in any case, getting back to her relationship with Rousseau, um, well, I guess getting, no, getting back to what she thinks partial civilization is like, which can be shown by more things she says about Rousseau. So on page 13, um, the first paragraph on page 13, I still do wish the, Impressed by the misery and disorder which pervaded society and fatigued with jostling against artificial fools. Right, so again, artificial means they're not acting out of natural motives or something like that. Um, they're unnatural fools. Um, Rousseau became enamored of solitude. This is true. Um, right? Rousseau spent a lot of his life trying to find ways to live in solitude, although it always ended up being near some aristocratic women who could support him or something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, and being at the same time an optimist, he labors with uncommon eloquence to prove that man was naturally a solitary animal. Right, so, th so this is the, the sequence she sees in Rousseau. Rousseau sees that this bad state of partial civilization is a state of falseness, of being out of step with nature, with our human nature. Um, he knows it's bad. He doesn't uh, 
he can't stand thinking about it enough to carry his investigation further and see exactly why it's bad. And he just says to himself, number one, I'm getting out of here. And number two, this must all be human beings' fault. It couldn't be God's fault. And putting those two things together, he says, so obviously God lent, melt, melt, lent, meant us to live in this nice way on our own, is solitary, <laughs> right? And then that's what he goes on to prove. So he's been, so, I mean, he himself is a victim, actually. Rousseau himself, although he's reacting against this falseness, is a victim of it. He ends up engaging in self-deception and what um, nowadays people call motivated reasoning, but they haven't discovered this, right? I mean, that people like to make arguments for things that they already believe are true, <laughs> or that they want to be true. Right, so I mean, that he engages in, he, he brings all his uh, argumentative power and eloquence to bear trying to show that the best and most natural way to live is uh, to be solitary because that's the way he likes to be even though the reason he likes to be that way is only because he's living in a bad society. So that's the more complicated critique of Rousseau. Um, that one I have to say definitely has something to it. I mean, it's more psychological, of course, than engaging with his position directly. It's trying to explain why, even though this is a bad position, Rousseau found himself taking it. Um, so Wollstonecraft agrees with Rousseau that this society is bad and that therefore in a sense we have to withdraw from it, but not withdrawing into solitude. Solitude is unnatural for human beings. So I guess maybe this is one way that what she says about the state of nature is relevant. Although, I mean, yeah, the thing that's complicated about understanding her views about what's natural is that, you know, um, like Aristotle or like Hobbes when he talks about the law of nature, she's thinking of the, the this is a fully natural life for human beings. The future true civilization is, is, is the society that's founded on, on principles of human nature. Um, in the state of nature, we were acting on natural impulses or something like that, but we didn't have a natural society. Um, okay, anyway, be that as it may, solitariness is not natural for human beings one way or the other, she thinks. Um, so what kind of withdrawal do we need instead? And the answer is basically philosophy. <laughs> that is, we need to withdraw, as she puts it, to first principles, right? So this is the very first uh, line of chapter one. In the present state of society, it appears necessary to go back to first principles in search of the most simple truths and to dispute with some prevailing prejudice every inch of ground. Um, so, right, it's not a kind of imaginary archaeology where we trace the current state of civilization back to what it was or, or would have been like under a certain abstraction or something like that. Um, it's um, um, it's well, it's most like what Descartes tries to do in the meditations. Get back behind all our old opinions to the first principles that are right and that if you see them clearly, you can't doubt and then rebuild from there. Um, I 
Now, I mean, unlike Descartes, she doesn't have uh, she doesn't have a lot to say about how it's possible to do that. Of course, this foggy atmosphere that we're trying to pierce is exactly what makes it hard to see the first principles. But what she does say about it is that, um, as I understand it, um, if you can just uh, concentrate on these first principles for themselves and forget all the motives that you have for motivated reasoning, that is all the motives for action that you have that make you want to believe things are true even though they're not and so forth, then um, uh, if you do that successfully, then you'll be then these first principles will clear be clearly true. Um, right. So going on to the latter part of that paragraph, um, Um, right, she says that these first principles are unequivocal axioms on which reasoning is built. Though when entangled with various motives of action, they are formally contradicted either by the words or conduct of men. Right, so again, what she's saying is that, you know, if you can just confine yourself to reason, you won't be able to doubt these principles. They'll be they'll they'll be clear they'll clearly be axioms on which all other reasoning about these matters has to be built. Um, but as soon as you bring as you allow your motive to action to come in, then they're going to make you say and do things that contradict these principles. Um, um, what time is it now? I guess, I don't know, is it worth, well, yeah, let me. So this again is very similar to Hobbes. Now, that's what I'm wondering. How much detail is it worth going into to prove to you that this idea is also in Hobbes? But I don't know, I'll show it to you. This is Leviathan chapter 11, um, paragraph 21 at the end. It's towards the bottom of page 61 in this edition. Hmm. This suggests that it's just how far up the page is that makes a difference. Uh, anyway, for I doubt not, but if it had been a thing contrary to any man's right of dominion, or to the interests of men that have dominion, that three angles of a triangle should be equal to two angles of a square. That doctrine should have been, if not disputed, yet by the burning of all books of geometry suppressed as far as he whom it concerned was able. Right, so what Hobbes is saying is that um, there's nothing so obvious that people wouldn't deny it or suppress it if it contradicted their interests in dominion. Not even the axioms of geometry. So why is it that geometry seems to proceed confidently without all these distortions that political philosophy has? Well, it's because those geometrical truths on the whole don't contradict anyone's interest. Right? So the only people who study them are people who study them for, you know, purely for the sake of truth which remember Hobbes says is very as a very rare motivation. He claims that he has it, but most people don't. Um, most people are just trying to um, amass wealth and political power and so forth. So, um, um, so, uh, so that's why geometry comes out okay, but political philosophy, at least until now, has not been handled correctly. Now Hobbes says it will be, right? But um, by him. Um, so um, this is basically the same idea that Wollstonecraft is um, putting forward here. 
that the reason the first principles, what are really the first principles of social and political philosophy are not accepted as axioms the way geometrical axioms are, is because we're, um, we have all these false motives. And the false motives require falsehoods to back them up. Um, and again, Rousseau is an example of that. Presumably, according to her, Hobbes is also an example of it, right? I mean, it's fine for Hobbes to say, I don't have any political motives, but of course we know that he does, right? I mean, he's writing this during the English Civil War, for heaven's sakes, about the justification of absolute monarchy. <laughs> um, it's not just a geometrical problem to him. Um, well, it's not to Wollstonecraft either. Um, but um, I guess the best you can do in this situation is to try to, I don't know, is that the best you can do? There's, you know, um, a view that's common now and not obviously wrong, maybe right, that says that you're most likely to about be right about things that you are really emotionally involved in. Um, um, you know, so that would seem to, the standpoint epistemology, that would seem to suggest that someone who had to leave England because of the Civil War would be like the best person to write about the uh, problems with parliamentary government. Um, uh, but anyway, that's not what Wollstonecraft is saying. So from this point of view that Hobbes and Wollstonecraft are taking, has anybody received their grades for SA2 yet? No, but everyone will pretty soon. Um, uh, Wollstonecraft, like Hobbes, is saying, no, the, you know, the credentials for getting this right are going to be that I take this, that, that I manage to um, ignore my motivations, which given the bad state of society are, are, are bad motivations, um, and just focus on the question of, isn't this an obviously correct principle? All right, um, so what are these first principles? Um, so, um, well, I counted at least four of them, or I counted exactly four of them, but there might be more. Oh, I keep picking up Rousseau. I have several books on my table right now. I counted four of them. Um, the first three, although there aren't little numbers next to them, are basically listed right after that paragraph. So I think it's safe to say that those are among the first principles. Um, right, that is the first principles are, as she said in that first paragraph, their answers to some questions she's going to ask. In what does man's preeminence over the brute, over the brute creation consist? Right, the brute creation means non-human animals. In what does man's preeminence over the brute creation consist? The answer is as clear as that half is less than the is less than the whole. In reason. Right, so just like you know, one of Euclid's axioms is the part is less than the whole. So right, just like the axioms of geometry are um, absolutely clear. Uh, it's absolutely clear what the answer to this question, what is the preeminence of human beings over other animals? The answer is reason. This is different from what Rousseau said it was. Rousseau said it was the power of free choice. Right, that the, the, that the thing that humans had in the state of nature over other animals was not their ability to reason, which there was no occasion to do in the state of nature, Rousseau says, because um, there was no foresight and whatever. Um, the ability that humans had was the ability to decide whether to eat this or that, whether to imitate this animal or that animal, whereas all the animals have to just follow their instinct. So this is quite a different answer. 
Um, might be a better sociobiological answer too. Like I think a lot of people think that, but not just human, but that mammalian sociality has to do with like remembering who's done good or bad things to you in the past, keeping track of that and foreseeing, you know, what might happen depending on how you treat them. Anyway, never mind that. <laughs> um, what acquirement exalts one being above another? Answer. Virtue, we spontaneously reply. Now, I'm not sure if by one being she means human being or if she means virtue in a really general sense. Right, like, you know, Aristotle says the virtue of the ax is sharpness that allows it to cut, you know, because its function is cutting. The virtue of the eye is to see well. Um, so in that sense, you could say about all beings in general, what exalts one above another? Virtue. Um, if that's what she means, it doesn't have much content to it, however. Um, well, it might have a little bit, and this is how it might have a little content to it, and maybe this is what she means by it. That if it's true that reason is the human preeminence, I mean, after all, this is exactly how Aristotle, you know, decides what virtue is in the Nicomachean Ethics. The human preeminence is reason, logos in Greek. Um, so the human virtues must be virtues associated with reason somehow. Right, so the human virtues, what's virtuous for, a what's virtuous for an ax is to cut well. What's virtuous for a human being is to be reasonable well. I think that might actually be what she means. Um, and I'll say why maybe in a second. And then the last one, for what purpose were the passions implanted? This is a little harder to see why this is so obvious, but anyway, that man by struggling with them might attain a degree of knowledge Denied to the brutes, whispers experience. Whispers experience seems to me that this is empirical. Um, if you were to ask why that's so obvious, um, I mean, so it sounds like a religious reason, of course but it's not religious in the sense that you'd find it written in the Bible. Um, at least there is an interpretation of Genesis hidden in it, but it's just, and it's maybe not the most unusual one, but it's a strange one because remember they get thrown out of the garden for eating the tree of knowledge. So that is eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge. They didn't eat the tree. Um, so <laughs> they get thrown out of the garden for eating the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, um, so the interpretation of the story would be something like, you know, human beings were made subject to passions, to temptations, so that they would be, um, like tempted to leave their natural, their initial natural position and gain this knowledge that in a sense was, you know, foreign or forbidden to them, that that was God's intention all along. Um, so this is kind of a rationalist interpretation of the story something like what Hegel says about it. Um, it's something like what Kant implies about it. Um, and uh, I think given other things that she says in this chapter about like how she thinks there could be no evil in the world that wasn't part of God's design, um, that um, Whatever it is she, she means by religion and believing in God, and you should know by this point in the course that you can't take it for granted at all what that is. 
But whatever she means by it, she thinks the right version of it would be the one that thinks that human passions were given for us to struggle with in the attempt to gain knowledge and that that story should be used in it as an allegory of that. Um, this also could be seen as an interpretation of the first meditation or the first two meditations, especially like the end of the first meditation and the beginning of the second. At the end of the first meditation, Descartes' meditator says, like, you know, um, I'm going to imagine that this, this evil deceiver out to get me. And then I'm going to do the only thing that's within my power, use my will not to allow myself to be deceived. And um, so it's that passion, right? It's like that stubbornness or will not to be deceived that leads to the breakthrough at the beginning of the second meditation, where the meditator says, you know, try as they may to deceive me. Uh, they can't make me believe that I exist when I don't. <laughs> Um, all right, so anyway, um, those are those three uh, first principles. They're about reason, virtue, and knowledge. When you put them together, I think they imply that, um, that the most important things, the things that this full civilization will be set up to develop will be reason, virtue, and knowledge. Um, all of which on Rousseau's own admission were missing in the initial state of nature, right? In the initial state of nature, according to Rousseau, human beings didn't know basically anything, had no use for reason. And he says explicitly, didn't have any concept of virtue, let alone actual virtues. Um, that came only later when they started comparing themselves to other people and gradually built up these concepts of virtue. Um, so, so that's why those first principles tell us that, um, that Rousseau is wrong. If it's true that this state of partial civilization is a state of deception and um, fraud and uh, irrational action, then those first principles also are enough to tell us that we're not better off staying here. So those first principles in themselves point in this direction where she's trying to go. Um, they, right, it makes it self-evident that there is a way we're supposed to be, but we haven't experienced it yet. It must lie in the future. Um, and then the fourth principle, so this is not so clearly one of the first principles, but um, it's on the next page, but I think it could be counted as one. The society, let's see, what would happen if I held this further up here? Yeah, then the light is better. Society is formed in the wisest manner, whose constitution is founded on the nature of man. And she says that in the abstract, that strikes every thinking being so forcibly that it looks like presumption to a endeavor to bring forward proofs. That's what makes me think that's another first principle, right? It's something that when you look straight at it, you say, well, that's so obvious. Why would you bother to prove it? But when you find yourself in this false situation, it starts to look dubious. And so um, it also has to be included as a first principle with the first three. I guess maybe I should say it's really with the addition of that fourth principle that we see that the first three principles show that we should be trying to acquire reason and virtue and knowledge that that's what's important given the human nature. And the last principle says, so the best society will be the one that uh, most enables us to do that, enables us to become most rational, rational, virtuous, and knowledgeable. 
Um, excuse me. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip that and I'm going to talk about, uh, I was going to talk about how these principles go together. I'm not skipping very much. Maybe I should skip more. Well, no, this is too important. All right, so in in particular, boy, I should have written these four principles up, shouldn't I? Because I keep pointing, the board has four things on it, but it's not these four. So we need that list again, oh well. Um, right, the four principles were about reason, virtue, knowledge and the best society. So the best society, the one that allows us to exercise our reason, I think is really the order this goes in. And exercising our reason well will mean both being both virtuous and knowledgeable. Um, So um, given some relevant facts about human nature, um, uh, Wollstonecraft argues further that the best society will be and will be the most egalitarian society, will be the one in which people are most equal. So um, what are the relevant facts about human nature? Um, so here, when she's talking about why monarchy should be overthrown, um, she says, um, so this is on page 15, in the second to last, last paragraph. Um, but one power should not be thrown down to exalt another. Right? In other words, when we get rid of monarchy, we shouldn't replace it. Well, at least we shouldn't replace it with another monarchy. But those who are saying we shouldn't place it with another form of concentrated power. For all power inebriates weak man. Right? Inebriates means makes drunk. Inebriates weak man. And its ab abuse proves that the more equality there is established among men, the more virtue and happiness will reign in society. So this obviously, and again, taking that men in that sentence includes women is gonna like, you know, lead into her main point that the inequality between men and women is um, not just bad for women, but makes the society as a whole worse, right? It's, it's bad for men too. Power inebriates, it's, it's not good, right? It makes you drunken. Um, uh, it's going to lead you to harm yourself, not just others. Um, so, um, but it also beyond that implies something pretty radical about what this society might be like. It, I mean, like this society is going to, um, have the kind of equality that everyone agrees we had in the state of nature, basically. Only rather than being brutish, it's gonna, it's gonna be the opposite of that, right? Rather than all being equal because none of us knows very much and none of us has any power over anyone else. Um, um, or I guess no one, none of us has any power and none of us can be sure of defending ourselves and whatever. It's gonna be equal because everyone knows a lot and everyone is secure from everyone else and is able to you know, carry on their own business without fearing others, something like that. Um, and I guess, although again, this is before, she write this before, 
might not have been the for the first time she met him, but it was quite a while before she married him. But I mean, this is an idea that's not surprising concerning that, or given this idea, it's not surprising that her husband later on was the person who's known as the father of anarchism, <laughs> right? I mean, this is um, this is basically a like an anarchist vision of what's of what the best society would be like. No one will be drunk on power because there won't be any concentration of power. Now here's a question from Vanessa. Does she think society can ever truly reach this stage of civilization? Or is she mostly just stating that these principles are the way to achieve it, like guidelines for society? That is actually a super good question. Um, I mean, obviously it's a question, it's a good question about Hobbes and Locke as well. Um, not so much about Rousseau because he doesn't really, well, I don't, I don't know, unless you think Sparta is the ideal society. Anyway, um, uh, but I'm not sure what the answer is, to tell you the truth. I don't think she's optimistic about quickly arriving at this you know, state of true civilization. She might have been more optimistic about it in 1792 before she visited France than she was later. Um, um, right, because like I said, she was she was in France at the, at the height of the terror and she was in some danger herself because she was, you know, known to be friendly with some of the more moderate circles. And when they went off to the guillotine, she, you know, started to be afraid that she might be next. <laughs> um, so after that experience, she was like, yeah, maybe just one revolution isn't going to do it. <laughs> um, but at this point, yeah, maybe she was more optimistic that it could happen soon, that even it might be happening in France. I'm not sure. Um, 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 so, um, so that's what we're heading for and why, so to speak, and what is telling against it um, is what she calls prescription. Um, so prescription, um, prescription is actually, I guess, in origin, a technical term having to do with real property. Um, when you require, acquire land by prescription, it means you acquire it because you can show that you've occupied it for a long time and no one ever complained. Um, I think this doesn't really work anymore now that we have central registries and everything. I don't think you can do this now, but it was an important part of uh, like common law um, and not just in the common law and other legal systems too, right? Because most people um, couldn't produce like, you know, like when we bought this house, they had to settle the title. What that means is that basically the people who were selling it to us, well, it was a bank that was selling to us because it was foreclosed. But anyway, uh, the people who were selling it to us had to show a train of title back to the original source of title, which in this case is probably a grant from the King of Spain, I guess. Right, So they had to show that the king of Spain acquired it by conquest, right? Because Locke never won out about that. <laughs> the king of Spain acquired it by conquest, and then the king of Spain gave it to people, and then they gave it or sold it, or, and they split it up, and so on and so forth. And there's a chain of title from me all the way back to them. But in traditional societies, no one had anything like that. 
right? How did you know that this was so-and-so's field? Well, everyone knew it was so-and-so's field. So-and-so lives there. <laughs> and maybe you know, oh, so-and-so's father lived there or so-and-so bought it from someone else and they always lived there, right? But that's the, that, so that was acquiring land by prescription. So like as a metaphor, justifying um, a law or custom by prescription means saying, how do I know this is a good law or a custom? We've always had it as far as we know, as far back as we can look, right? Like we're found in possession of it, so to speak, as opposed to rationally justifying it. It's a good law because start from these first principles and you can see this is the law we should have. So, so the enemy of progress is prescription and that's what she sees Burke as having argued for against price. And I think that's a, probably a pretty good summary of a lot of Burke's um, uh, argument and reflections on the French Revolution. He basically says, you know, we English people um, have our ancient liberties and we've never seen any reason to change them. And uh, we look on what you guys are going, going, doing over there in France with horror. You know, if you want to reform your monarchy, he says, you also have ancient traditions you could have used to reform it back to those, but instead you decided to destroy everything and um, uh, nothing good is going to come of this. So she, she's calling that a, an argument from prescription and she's saying that's the worst thing you could have. Um, that's the opposite of reason. Um, so, um, this is on page 12. This is right after the part I was reading before where she says, you might, you might think it's superfluous to even to try to prove this. It's so obvious that, that the right society is the one that's based on the nature of human beings that is rationally based. She says, um, proof must be brought or the stronghold of prescription will never be forced by reason, right? Prescription is like a, has like a fortress and reason has to force its way in. Yet to urge prescription as an argument to justify the depriving men, and here's one place where she puts or women in parentheses, because this is going to be the most important instance for her point. Depriving men or women of their natural rights is one of the absurd sophisms which daily insult common sense, right? So the reason I say this is, you know, it's important for to add or women in parentheses just here is because of course, like the main argument against feminism, you know, since Socrates first raises the idea in the Republic, he says, um, you know, you're gonna laugh when I say this because it's so contrary to what people have always done. That's the objection that she's expecting to, right? What, you think women should be independent of men? That's like an attack on family values. This is the way human beings have always lived, you know? Um, you shouldn't tinker with it. And she's saying that's the worst kind of argument you could have. Um, because um, if you want to know what's the natural way for human beings to live, don't look at the way they've always lived as far as you, as you know. This is where I wish I had that original list back here. That will just lead you back to barbarism and savagery, right? That's where that comes from. If you want to know what's the natural way for human beings to live, use your reason to figure it out. Um, I see I only have one minute left and there were other things, well, maybe less important. I wanted to talk more about barbarism. We'll probably come up more. 
again later. Yeah. Um, maybe actually it's better to close by showing once again how close this is to Hobbes. So um, this is the beginning of the very same paragraph that I read the end of before, chapter 11. Did I say chapter 11 before? No, I said it wrong. Chapter 11, paragraph 21. Ignorance of the causes and original constitution of right, equity, law, and justice disposeth, disposeth a man to make custom and example the rule of his actions in such manner as to think that unjust which it hath been the custom to punish, in that just of the impunity and approbation whereof they can produce an example, or as the lawyers which only use this false measure of justice barbarously call it, a precedent. Right? So what Hobbes is saying is, don't argue with me based on the common law. Don't tell me there's a precedent for limits on the power of the king or something like that. Uh, there's a precedent for the parliament to have this, this, that, and the other privilege against the king. Um, uh, precedents just show that people have been doing in that way, but it gives no evidence that it was the right way to do it. If you wanna know what's the right way to do it, you have to know the nature and consequences of law, right, equity, etc. That is, you have to know how to derive things rationally from facts about human nature. Um, so, um, so I guess I, you know, I'll just close on this note. You can, you can see that in a way, Wollstonecraft is much more radical than the other people we've read so far, even Rousseau. But in a sense, the basis of the way she thinks about it is already present in Hobbes. Um, okay, on that note, I will um, see you Thursday. Okay, bye. Thank you.